Hi, today's video is really an extension of our last video where I tested various thermal interface materials, thermal greases, thermal pastes, you know, the goo that you use to put on a CPU in order to facilitate the heat removal and into a heat sink. I showed you the machine that I used to do the testing, and then I compared a variety of leading commercial pastes. In addition, I tested two compounds that I formulated, and I beat them. What I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna show you why I was able to beat them and exactly how I was able to do it. I'm gonna show you how to make it. To begin with, we need to get a better understanding of heat. Heat and sound are both manifestations of kinetic energy. The heat energy in this room represents the mass of all of the air molecules in this room times the velocity squared of the speed at which they are careening into each other and bouncing off of the walls inside of the room. If you warm the air in this room, you don't increase the number of molecules, you don't increase the mass of the molecules, you increase their velocity. The same thing holds for the solid particles inside of a bar of aluminum like this. Inside of this bar, the individual aluminum atoms are held in a 3D matrix or lattice by the elastic electrostatic forces between them and their neighbors. And even though it doesn't look like it, the aluminum atoms in this bar are moving very quickly. But what they're doing is they're vibrating back and forth around their center position. And that vibration is their velocity. If you heat up this bar, you increase the velocity of those little springy aluminum atoms and increase the distance that they travel when they are bouncing back and forth. If you continue to heat it, they will move fast enough that they move far enough that they begin to overcome the interatomic forces and it melts. That heat though is chaotic, it's random, it's isotropic, meaning it's the same in all three dimensions. There's no favored axis of movement. Sound also is kinetic energy. When I take this hammer and I slam it onto the end of this bar, I'm adding energy into the bar in the form of accelerating the atoms at the point of contact and forcing them because of their higher velocity to move away from that point of contact and further. As a result, they apply a pressure to the atoms right behind them, which also causes them to move further away from the point of impact, and so on and so on. And what happens is you produce a velocity wave that moves through the bar at the speed of sound in aluminum. This is a very, very rapid process and happens at thousands of meters per second, several times the speed of a high-speed rifle bullet. When you take that hammer and you strike the atoms in that bar, this process appears to be almost instantaneous. In fact, it takes about 25 microseconds for that energy to move through that bar. However, heat doesn't work that way. When you take this blowtorch and you heat the end of this bar, I'm adding substantially more heat than I did with the hammer. And even though I'll eventually add enough heat that I can't hold on to the end of this bar, it still doesn't feel warm at this end. And the reason for that is that heat energy, unlike a coherent wave moving through the bar, it's a statistical equilibration of all of the atoms within the bar, an increase in velocity of all of those atoms. It moves sideways, it moves forward, it moves backward, and it is a very sluggish process. Not yet. And aluminum is one of the best thermal conductors in existence. Copper is about twice as thermally conductive as aluminum. And 
Silver is a little bit better than that. There are a couple of ceramic materials that are slightly better again, and then there's diamond, carbon nanotubules, and graphene. That's it. Just about every other material in existence is a poorer thermal conductor than aluminum. Steel is about one-third the thermal conductivity of the aluminum. Add a little bit of chromium to the steel, make it into stainless steel, and it's about 20 times less conductive. And all organic materials, oils, resins, rubbers, plastics, are about a thousand times less thermally conductive than the aluminum. And this is a very important thing, and I'm going to show you just how significant real this effect is. All right, so I set up this demonstration, and what we have here is two solid one meter long aluminum rods that have been supported on this table and have a thermal probe mounted in the end of each rod at the same location. Those probes feed down into this temperature meter here. The T1, or the top measurement, which is this, measures this rod here. And T2, which is this wire, measures this rod here. The rods are identical except for one, one important fact. Halfway or partway through this rod over here, I sliced it and I interposed a millimeter thick piece of plastic. So one one thousandth the length of this entire rod is a piece of plastic. Otherwise, the rods are identical. The bottom of the rods are going to be placed into a pot of boiling water. And what we're going to do is see what happens to the temperature over a period of time when we compare the performance of these two different rods. So I'm going to put this insulation up here to try to minimize any changes due to the air in the room, like this. And then I'm going to bring this thing back and put it into the boiling water. And so let's see what happens to these temperatures in T1 and T2. And this, just for reference, is the temperature inside of the meter itself. I chose to use Fahrenheit simply because you could do this with Celsius, but the Fahrenheit unit is smaller, so the monitor gives us a slightly better resolution when you're using Fahrenheit. But this would certainly work if we decided we wanted to do this in metric. All right, so you can see we've been going about 23 minutes, and you can see the T1 over here, which represents the probe in the rod that has the uh, plastic in it, has increased about five and a half degrees. And that the probe T2 that's in the solid rod has increased about 10.7 degrees. So not quite a doubling in the thermal conductivity in the solid rod versus the rod with the interposed piece of plastic that represents one one thousandth of its length. That's pretty impressive how significant that is in slowing down heat transfer. But the other thing to take away is that the rod, the solid rod here, is still only a little bit warm at this end after a total of nearly 24 minutes in boiling water. So as you can see, even the solid aluminum rod is very sluggish in moving heat and it represents a real bottleneck in keeping electronic devices cool. Now you may say, now wait a minute, a long metal rod is not the most effective way in moving heat substantial differences. You could use an active system like a water flow loop, or you could use an osmotic or a convective type of device like a heat pipe. And yes, that would be a much more effective way to move heat a great distance, and it would be part of a thermal management system, but you still got to get the heat into and out of the heat pipe at each end because the manufacturers of electronics, whether it's CPUs, or lasers, or transistors, don't make them as integral units with the heat sink. You're going to have to use a thermal interface material. And because they operate, they perform so much worse than the bulk materials, the first thing that you would want to do is to try to make that layer as thin as possible. That's why last year when I was doing the video on the thermal epoxy, I went through a very simple, very easy method to improve the surfaces. For less than a dollar and about 10 minutes of time, you can take the stock surfaces of the heatsink or the CPU or whatever you're trying to cool 
and you can flatten and smooth them remarkably. And by doing so, by making them flatter and smoother, you allow them to approximate more closely. This will improve the performance of any thermal interface material and is actually more important than the differences in the thermal interfaces. So surface prep is key. The other issue is that as bad as the thermal interface materials are compared to the bulk material, nevertheless, they're about 10 to 100 times better than air. So you really have to get rid of the air. And the simplest way that you could do that is to simply take a drop of oil or liquid, put it between the two surfaces like this, and eliminate the air, and you will substantially improve the thermal conductivity. Nevertheless, you're limited to a material, the oil, that's about a thousand times worse than the thermal conductivity of the bulk materials. Now, if you could apply a sufficient amount of pressure, last time I talked about a very good alternative, which is indium film. It's inexpensive, and it is a low melting point, very soft elemental metal that under sufficient pressure will plastically flow between rough surfaces eliminate the air and provide a metal to metal contact that can be as much as 10 times as effective as any thermal compound out there. It's great. The problem is the amount of pressure you need to see that kind of performance gain means that for something like the size of a CPU, you would need to be able to apply a pressure over a quarter of a ton. It just isn't practical. You need something that will flow like the oil, but at the same time has a higher thermal conductivity than the oil. And the way you do that is you add powders or materials that have a high thermal conductivity and form a flowable paste. And that's where we get into the engineering of the thermal interface material. I find this really interesting because there's a number of different issues you have to think about, and they all interact. But some of them are actually contraintuitive. They don't work the way you think they do, and that's what I find fascinating. If you look at these zirconium oxide balls that I have on the table, and imagine them as sort of magnified, scaled up versions of the powders that we would add to the oils. And you look at this tray that I've put in front, where I've neatly lined up these 20 millimeter balls in this grid array. If you were to take this material and you filled the spaces between them with oil, and this represents the thermal interface, this material can be loaded into the oil at a maximum concentration of 64%. You can't get any higher. If you tried to add another ball like this, you'd either have to add more oil or it would be operating in air, and so you're going to lose ground. Now, it gets worse because if you don't have an atomic force microscope and you can line these things up in a nice neat grid like this, with typical mixing and clumping, the highest concentration of solids you can get in a liquid is 60%, meaning 40% of that volume remains the low thermal conductivity oil. Now, you still might think, well, wait a minute. Zirconium oxide, it's a good thermal conductor. If we can load that interface space with as much as 60% of it being this material, are we 64% of the way, or 60% of the way, to the bulk thermal conductivity? Not even close. It turns out that by adding these balls to the oil, we will improve the performance over the oil alone, but disappointingly, not much. The contact points between these balls and between the balls and the surfaces are atomically small points. And so a substantial amount of the heat that's transferred through this still has to make some of its way through the low thermal conductivity oil. We gotta get rid of the oil. Now, if you look at the props, you probably know where I'm going. If you were to take a much smaller diameter ball and you added it to this, you could potentially exclude additional oil and get a much higher solids loading. And if the balls are small enough, theoretically, you could add as much as, or take away, as much as 60% of that remaining volume and turn it into a solid, moving to a total solids loading of 84%. And if we carried it even further to a smaller powder, we could remove 60% of that remaining 16% and get ourselves into the 90s, and so on and so on. Asymptotically approaching a solid material with much more contact area. This process is called densification, and we're going to get into that in more detail when we do the video on ultra-high performance concrete. The problem with this, though, is what we've now made is concrete. This is like a rock. It will not flow. 
And so even though densification is an important process, and we will use this in making the resins or the materials, nevertheless, there are limits. You can only go so far. The second issue has to do with shear loading or viscous forces. This ball interacts with the oil on the surface, and the oil molecules themselves interact. And so when you take a ball like this and you drop it down through the air, the viscous forces with the air are very low, and it drops very quickly. But if I take this low viscosity silicon oil and I drop the ball through here, you'll see that it drops almost as fast as it does through the air. It's pretty quick. It's lower, but pretty quick. If I take the same type of oil, except a much longer, higher molecular weight version of this oil, and I drop the ball in here, you can see that it drops painfully slow. It's like molasses in January. This means that if I were to use a very high viscosity oil, I would reach high viscosity levels at a lower solids loading. And so you want to use the thinnest oil that you can for this process. It turns out that with silicon oils, you can get down to about 10 centipoise. Once you go below that point, the vapor pressure increases and they have a tendency to evaporate. So 10 is about the, the best you can do. Now the next thing is, what materials should you use? Now originally, I was very enamored with the idea of using a very high thermal contact, uh, conductive material. Diamond, graphene, carbon nanotubules. They don't work. The reason they don't work is because of the irregular shapes of the graphene nanoplatelets, these long, stringy carbon nanotubules, or the cuboidal kind of crystals of diamond. They don't allow very efficient densification. They lock up earlier on. So even though they grant more thermal conductivity than the zirconium oxide would, the problem is because you'd have a lower solids loading and because the oil is so bad, that whatever you gain here, you lose by leaving more oil in the mixture. What you want is a spherical shaped particle. There are a lot of materials that are available in the shape, metal powders, ceramic powders, but not those other materials that I had looked into originally. Now the next question is size. How big should you go? I like the nano field, the nanoscience field, nano powders and quantum dots and nanobots. But the point is, in this particular case, you actually want to use the largest size particles that you can because of that problem with shear forces. As you decrease the diameter of the balls, for a given volume of material, you increase the surface area, you increase the interaction with the liquid, and you increase viscosity. If you took a look at a couple of the videos we did earlier on epoxies, you saw how I took a runny epoxy resin and it turned it into a paste and even a putty by adding just a few percent of a nanopowder called fumed silica. The huge surface area and interaction with the liquid will thicken it up very rapidly. So we want to use the biggest particles possible. Now, where do we start? The big question is, how close should we assume that these surfaces get? And that again is a little bit of a soft issue. Looking at the industry and the manufacturers and what they use as sort of the standard for thermal bond lines or the thermal interface line, these are probably based on the fact that there is pretty similar viscosity in most of the leading compounds and there's sort of narrow range of how much force you can literally put on an electronic device. And they come up with 25 microns as sort of a, a guidepost. That's a reasonable thickness and probably the kind of thickness you will see when you apply a heat sink to a CPU. So obviously you don't want a particle size that's larger than 25 microns, otherwise you'll keep this artificially far apart. But because of irregular clumping and mixing, you actually want the particle to be significantly smaller than 25 microns, but no smaller than necessary. Again, doing some research on this, and again, my own experimentation, I found that sort of the sweet spot is approximately five microns for the largest size particle. So the next question is, how do we do this densification? If you just did it in one stage, you might think, OK, we take these large balls, and then we get the nanopowder, and we add this to this. But like I said, the very small particles will add viscosity very quickly. So we want to add the largest sizes possible and step downward. And a good rule of thumb is to use a factor of 10 in the diameters of the particles. So if we were using 20 millimeter balls here, 
The next size ball we would want to go down to is two millimeter. And if we carried it even further, 200 microns. How much should you use? For those types of ratios, you approximately want to use 25% of the weight of the next largest ball. So if this tray contains about 400 grams of the zirconium oxide, it's really heavy, you would want to add approximately 100 grams of the two millimeter size balls to this. And if we had 200 micron balls in this example, you'd want to add 25 grams, one quarter of the next size largest particle. And that's it. Those are basically the principles that you need to follow in order to make this high performance material. So we're going to take these principles, we're going to go next door, and I'm going to actually show you how I make the material. We're going to mix up some thermal paste. Come on. Okay, as I said, we made two different compounds last time in the last video. One is a very simple to make, very low cost compound that performs remarkably well, and the other is a very high performance material. So we're going to start out with the simple. And I selected as the liquid to use for this particular formulation glycerin, anhydrous glycerin. The reason I chose this is because it's super easy to obtain. You can get this on Amazon, you can get this at a local pharmacy. It's non-toxic, it's water soluble, so it's easy to clean up. It has a very low vapor pressure, so it doesn't evaporate. And it has a remarkably high thermal condu conductivity. Except for water, it is the highest of any common liquid and helps to compensate for the fact that in also to keep this simple, we're not going to be doing the densification process. We're just going to depend on one size powder, the five micron aluminum powder. So to begin with, what we're going to do is put on a couple of gloves and then we're going to use a very sophisticated piece of equipment, the alchemist's friend. We're going to use a mortar and pestle. And we're going to weigh out four grams of this liquid into the bottom of the container. Because this is dense, this is only about 3.4 cc's. And then into this, we're going to add 14 grams of the aluminum powder. Now this stuff is pretty bulky and You'll probably think at first, there's no way I'm going to get this incorporated. But you will. It's surprising. And what this simply requires is patience. You want to mix slowly at first, not because this stuff tends to get into the air very easily. Those are pretty big particles. But simply because you don't want this to spray out onto the table. And as you can see, it's a pretty loose powder right now. The liquid hasn't worked its way into it. So you want to start out by just starting to push this down into the liquid and working it up through from the bottom as it begins to incorporate into the powder. And this doesn't take very long, a couple of minutes. And this is it. This is the material that we tested last time and proved to be just about as good as arctic silver. And it lasts. Because it's water soluble, you wouldn't want to use this, say, on a solar cell array outside. But certainly inside where it's not going to be wet, it's not a problem. And as a matter of fact, I've had this uh, used on a fish tank, LED fish tank system, that's been operating for a couple of years, and it still performs very well. So the stuff doesn't dry out. The stuff is easy to apply. It smears and it's very smooth. It's very creamy and it sticks to the surfaces very well. So this is how you make the inexpensive stuff. And the advantage of this is that instead of costing a dollar or two dollars a gram, this will cost you a couple of pennies a gram. So it's a great alternative if you want to get into doing this, but you don't want a lot of equipment and you don't want to spend a lot of money. So now let's move to the high performance material. All right, so now what we're going to do is mix up the high performance material. And for this, we're going to follow all of the principles that I covered in the other room. Now, when I described the process of densification, I described it from the big to the little. But in fact, in doing the synthesis, you actually want to work in the other direction. You want to work from little upward because it makes it a lot easier to disperse the different products. So to begin with, what we're going to do is we're going to be using a 10 centipoise silicon oil. This, like I said, is about as 
thin or as um, watery as you can get before this starts to evaporate. And so we want to make sure that we don't lose the, the liquid fraction over time. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to take a small beaker and we're going to add to that beaker 16.5 grams of the silicon oil. So I'll grab a little stopper here, or a little eyedropper here, and we'll start doing that. Okay, nailed it. Now the next thing that we're going to do is add the smallest powder. Now theoretically, I could stay with all the same material, but it has to do with availability. You want a spherical product that's going to be down around the 20, 30, 40 nanometer size. The problem with staying with aluminum, for example, all the way through is when you get down to nanometer sized particles in aluminum, they become very dangerous to deal with, not only inhalation, but much more importantly, they can burst into flame because of their huge surface area, they can interact with the atmosphere. So it's very difficult to obtain that, and a far better choice is to use zinc oxide. Zinc oxide is also a spherical product that's available in the right size range, and it is a very good thermal conductor. It's used in a lot of thermal pastes. And so I have zinc oxide, and to this I'm going to add 8.75 grams of the zinc oxide. Now, because the zinc oxide has twice the density of aluminum, if you were doing this process at this stage with aluminum, I would be using half this weight because it's the volume we were trying to achieve. So because of the higher density, we're using twice as much by weight to get the same volume as we would if we were using the same types of product all the way through. Now, one of the challenges in dealing with nanomaterials, nano-sized particles, is that because of the very large surface area and the fact that they have a lot of van der Waals forces between them as a result of that, they're very difficult to disperse. They tend to clump and stay in, in groups rather than break up and disperse well in the liquid. And I don't think it's even possible to adequately disperse this mechanically, or I should say by hand. What we're going to do is we're going to use an, a sonicator in order to be able to break this up. Now a sonicator is basically a very powerful ultrasound generator that focuses its energy down through a horn here. And what the horn does is it will move up and down very, very quickly at around 20 kilohertz and create enormous accelerations on the order of 100,000 Gs. As a result of that very rapid movement, it will cavitate the liquid and it will create a lot of turbulence. And that will break up the individual little particles as well as mix them or blend them in with the liquid. So we're going to put this small container inside the sonicator here. We're going to raise this up like this. Now, the sonicator can generate a lot of power. And so we're going to actually turn this all the way down to 100 watts. And because that will still cause a lot of heating in here, what we're going to do is we're going to run this on a 50% duty cycle, which means five seconds on, five seconds off, to give this more time to distribute its heat into the environment. And we're going to run this entire run, five seconds on, five seconds off, for a total of six minutes. The other thing about this is this is very loud, and it can actually be dangerous. And so they will sell these with enclosures to protect the hearing of the people around them. But the enclosures are expensive, they're bulky, and they do limit your access to the equipment here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to slip on a couple of pair of headphones, assure that nobody else is in the building, and then we're going to start this running. Okay, I've got my headphones on. Now let's go ahead and turn this on. All right, here we go. Okay. Ah, that feels good. Now this material here is very warm. It's hot to the touch. 
And that's one of the reasons why the duty cycle. This can certainly mix up much larger quantities than this. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this over here and I'm going to go to the second stage, which is I'm going to mix up the next size powder in the scale. We're going to start by taking this jar. We're going to measure out 15.15 grams of this material into the jar. That's it. Now two things. One is that as I described, I'm going to put the actual ratios below the video, so you'll have the actual ratios of the added components. But because of the fact that we're going to be adding these things in different containers for different steps, I leave, inevitably, I leave some of the material behind. So the ratio of the zinc oxide to the oil that I gave you was correct. But because of the fact that I'm leaving some behind, the absolute numbers are not really that important. It's the ratio. So even if I made a liter of this stuff right now, I would still only be taking out 15.15 grams. So depend on the ratios below. Don't focus on the numbers, the absolute numbers I'm giving you to give you those ratios. The second thing, and this was very, very important, is I made a fortuitous discovery, one of those eureka moments, and it was made by accident. What happened was early on when I was doing this, I wasn't sure what the actual working fluid was going to be, whether it was going to be a glycerin or it was going to be a polyalcohol or a silicon oil. And so I had ordered a variety of different types of nano and micro powders. I ordered zinc oxide in both a neat or a pure form, as well as a coated form that had a silane coating, a molecular layer of silane over the, the outside of the spheres. The reason that's done is to increase its hydrophilic affinity. In other words, to allow it to interact better with polar or water-like solvents. Let's it say, stay suspended longer. However, I was doing this once at about two o'clock in the morning. I was really tired, I was not paying attention. And I noticed that when I finished this step, the material was a lot thinner than I expected. And what I had accidentally done is taken the zinc oxide with the silane coating and used it in the nonpolar silicon oil. Really, it's not what it's made for. The point is, though, it was a lot thinner, and I knew the numbers were right. And so I just went ahead and proceeded to make the full formulation, but using the wrong powder, and it was substantially less viscous, which allowed me to actually increase the solids loading a little more for the same amount of viscosity, and I got better performance. So silane coated zinc oxide, not the plain zinc oxide, is the appropriate material. Now to add to this, we got a couple choices. I'm going to be adding 300 nanometer aluminum powder. Now this stuff is not way down in the nanometer scale, and it has a little bit more vulnerability than say the five micron powder to ignition, but it's still not too bad. Nevertheless, this size is pretty hard to obtain. I get it from a guy that I know out in California with a laboratory that is able to produce this. So you may not be able to get a hold of the 300 nanometer aluminum powder. But if you can't, the same sky spring supplies copper powder, which is spherical, in the same size range. And so you could, uh, you could use copper for this stage, and it works almost as well. So it's a perfectly legitimate alternative, and it won't burst into flame on you. But we're going to stay with the aluminum for this demonstration here. And so what I'm going to be doing is adding 10.5 grams of the 300 nanometer powder to this right here. Okay, 10.5. Now what we're going to do is we're going to measure the full weight of this jar. And you'll understand why in just a second. Full weight, 158 grams. I'm now going to take this jar that has a little bit of tap water in it, and I'm going to fill it to 148 grams, 10 grams less than this guy. Again, this will make sense in just a sec. This is just tap water. That's it. OK. Now, the reason I did that is because this material here is too thick to have combined in the beginning with the ultrasound. 
we have to use another method of incorporating this fine powder. And you might be able to do this mechanically, but I don't think you will be able to do a good job. And so what we're going to do is use a different device called a paste mixer. Now these devices are available industrially for mixing very thick pastes. As you can see, it says solder paste mixer. This model here, unlike the many thousands of dollars you can pay for pharmaceutical quality mixers, is sort of a cheap Chinese knockoff. And I bought this used on eBay for just a couple of hundred bucks and I hacked it. But the basic principle is the same and they're really very useful. The reason you would use this for solder paste is if you have a jar, say a half kilogram jar of solder paste that sits around your shop for a long time, the, some of the solids can sink to the bottom and you want to blend it up. And this is the device you would use to do that with. So if I open up the inside of this thing and you take a look, you'll see that there is this rotating table here. Looks a little bit like a centrifuge. And this table is mounted on a spindle which is driven by a motor and spins around. What you can't see is that underneath the, this platter here is a pulley that does not rotate with the motor. It's actually fixed to the structure. And because it's not rotating, when these cups out here move around, the belt that attaches their individual pulleys on each side to that fixed pulley causes these individual cups to rotate. So if you watch, it forms a planetary type action here where this goes around in a circle and these individually go around on a circle. And what that does is that the g-forces, the centripetal forces, tend to push the liquids down to the outer part right here just because of rotation. But because this cup is constantly rotating like this, what is the bottom of the, cup, of the jar continues to change position. So this blends by a shear force against the inside of the, the jar, the container. In addition, the centrifugal forces or the centripetal forces that are pushing the denser materials to the bottom are always doing that, but the bottom keeps changing its position. And this creates a lot of turbulence below the surface. And just like the turbulence that's created with this, both of these devices are very effective at outgassing or at removing dissolved air because you're constantly exposing new surface without folding in air. And the very large turbulence here, which turns around underneath the surface, again, doesn't fold in air. And we don't want air. Air is our enemy. So this is good for degassing, and it's good for blending. The hacks I performed are very simple. You see how I wrote, add 10 grams. In order to get this not to vibrate so much, I add a little bit to this cup, and that reduces the vibration. In addition, because I'm not doing solder paste, I'm just doing lightweight jars of material, I didn't mind the fact that if I got a much bigger motor in here and brought up the RPMs, I could increase the, the mixing and speed up the operation a lot. So this thing actually rotates twice as fast as the stock machine. And because these are so much lighter, this can withstand those forces. In addition, I added a better cooling fan, better cooling system inside so this wouldn't overheat. So what we're going to do is we're going to install the heavier of the two jars in the add 10 gram side. Make sure the lid is on nice and tight. We don't want that to spill. Same thing here. And we're going to put this on the lighter side and force these in there like that. Then we're going to close the lid and we're going to turn this on and we're going to run this for 12 minutes. So let's take a look and see what we got. All right, nothing flew apart. And let's look at the two jars. This is the counterweight jar, so it's got nothing in it. And this is the blended jar here. And let's take a look inside. And you can see that you get a nice, thick, creamy material. But clearly, this is too thick for the ultrasound to be able to blend up. And the next stage after this 
is too thick for this paste mixer. So we're going to have to go to another method of getting the final incorporation of the final particles. So we're going to bring this over here. And once again, we're going to use the alchemist's friend. And what we're going to do is I'm going to take 8.55 grams out of here and place it in the bottom of the mortar, mortar of the mortar and pestle. very homogeneous. To this, we're going to add 14.6 grams of the 5 micron aluminum powder. So we'll tear that out and start going. Oh, I've already got that in there. Okay, 14.6 grams. Ten milligrams off, not bad. You want to be pretty precise with these measurements, though. So now you're probably thinking, probably not. Well, let's see. Now the point is, if you do this for a total of an honest five minutes with this mortar and pestle. First of all, you'll get really strong arms. But secondly, you'll get a very good thermal compound. But what I discovered is that if you do an honest 30 minutes, in other words, you go for five minutes, your arm starts to burn, you go get a drink, you come back, five more minutes, and you go walk the dog, you come back, and you do 30 real minutes, the performance of the material actually continues to increase. So it may be, in fact, that I haven't reached the limit of the performance of this material. And with even, even better incorporation, you may be able to produce a superior material to the one that I demonstrated. And because there are industrial mixers that can handle very thick pastes like this, that can potentially do a much better job than I'm doing, that may be very possible. However, they cost many thousands of dollars, and the mortar and pestle is certainly a very inexpensive way of doing the same thing. And as you can see now, this material has become very spreadable, and with a little bit more mixing, will become even creamier. Now let's just pretend for a second that I had done this for 30 minutes. One of the problems with mixing it in this way is unlike the first two steps, this does incorporate air. I'm folding air into this. And as a consequence, that's going to decrease the performance of the material. So one step remains. Let's go over to the vacuum pump. OK, so this is the final step. We're going to take the material that I combined in the mortar and pestle and to which I added some air. And we're going to place it inside the vacuum chamber. And we're going to run this down to a couple of microns for at least several hours. I typically run this for six hours. And there is a noticeable improvement in the performance when you do remove some of that incorporated air. So this step is definitely worth it. But that's it, Mr. Reardon. That's it. This is the material that we ended up demonstrating last time performed so well against the commercial thermal pastes. And as I promised, what we're going to do is we're going to send a couple of samples of this material over to Linus Tech. And if they're willing, see what kind of uh, results they get when they compare this against other commercial materials. I've also put below this video in the description a list of the exact proportions of the materials we used in order to make this. And you obviously saw how to do this. Now, most of you are not going to have access to this type of equipment. But if you do have access to a reasonable university or industrial laboratory, they will have this. And they may even have better stuff. And as I said, there is a possibility you may be able to actually improve on the results that I achieved by using better equipment.
But in any case, we did get a pretty good compound out of this, and you should be able to reproduce it. If you don't want to take the time, the effort, or the money to try to reproduce this, we will go ahead and we will put this material on sale on our website. As I showed you last time, it performs very well, and it's less expensive than most of the commercial materials out there. And it helps to support the cost, the expenses that we have in producing these videos. There's a lot of money involved in gathering the equipment and the materials. Also, if you have any kind of questions or want to make any kind of comments, put them below in the comment section because I read them all. And it also helps to give me ideas for future videos. It also helps YouTube, their algorithms, to spread the video, to distribute it out to a greater number of people. In addition, if there is any possibility you're even considering subscribing, please do it. It has more value than you might realize. We cover a broad range of topics if you look at our playlist. We cover a broad range of different types of technologies. We go into a lot of detail and we give you practical applications. But in addition to that, by increasing the size of the channel, you help us to produce better videos. Because as the footprint of the channel increases, we become more attractive to potential collaborators, to interviews, to site visits, and we can produce a broader range of more interesting kind of comment, content. So hopefully you found this interesting and useful and enjoyable. And I just want to thank you very much for spending your time and watching. You take care and have a wonderful evening.